mode. Hello everyone, my name's Arshilahi and I'm online today with good friend, business partner and all round nice guy, Neil McCoy Ward. Neil, are you online? <laughs> yeah, thanks Arsh for that excellent introduction. Right, okay, right. Tonight what we're going to do, Neil, is we're going to cut the chit chat and we're going to get straight into straight into content because we've got a lot to cover tonight. We're online only for 60 minutes uh, so those that are online straight away, congratulations, you're in for a great, great hour worth of content. So first thing we're going to do is just make sure, um, housekeeping rules, that on, on your screen on the right-hand side, you should have almost like a control panel which you can ask questions. If you can in there, can you just put that, uh, just so that you can hear us clearly and loudly, please? Okay, fantastic. Yeah, we've got Anna, we've got Helen, uh, Derek, Stuart, Adrian, Steve. Okay, fantastic. Right, so we've got a lot of people on board. Uh, so, Neil, what we're going to do, get straight into it. Right, okay, so a little bit about myself, not too much. Uh, I'm Arshilahi, and I run a group of 12 property companies with my brother Akilahi, together with landlords and letting agents, and we've been letting property since 1973. Uh, we've currently got over 500 tenants, a uh, majority of which are on benefits. Uh, that may scare a few people, but believe me when I think when I say that it's a business can actually be quite rewarding, um, as well as no, it can be it can be very rewarding. We've got 100% rent collection record and a very high 98% occupancy rate. So that's pretty much enough about me. I was very fortunate to be able to write articles in uh, such high-profile magazines such as Your Property Network, which is a magazine written by property investors for property investors. So if you're not already a, a subscriber to that, I would clearly, I would really suggest that you you subscribe to it just by clicking on yourpropertynetwork.co.uk. So that's enough about me. I'm going to pass you over to Neil. Um, Neil, what I'd like you to do is keep the introduction brief so that we can hit straight into content. Yeah, okay, Ash, yeah, I can do that. This won't be a big uh, introduction today, don't worry. So I've, um, first of all, hi, ladies and gentlemen. Good evening, and thanks for coming online. I've actually been a landlord since 2005. Um, so this is my 11th year now um, as a landlord. And it's been a, a bumpy ride, as some of you will know. Property is never easy. There's uh, huge highs, but there's also big lows as well. Um, and that's what Ash and I are going to be talking about today, this evening, how you can actually avoid a lot of the, um, the big lows with the deal sourcing side. So um, in terms of what I do day to day, people always ask me, what do you do? And it's a really long story. So the easy answer is I'm an entrepreneur. So no day is ever the same in my life. Um, I, I focus on deal sourcing, um, property investments. Rent to rent is probably my biggest earner now within the property field. Um, more than anything else that I do, all the others combined, um, doesn't compare to um, the income that I generate through rent to rent. So it's a fantastic strategy that complements deal sourcing amazingly. I have a marketing consultancy. And that's another reason why Ash and I teamed up because um, Ash initially asked me, how did you do what you did so quickly in terms of the marketing on such a low budget? So that's what we're going to talk a little bit about this evening as well. Most people know me in the corporate world as a sales trainer and a professional speaker. Um, and again, every day is different. Today I was, I was training a large corporate, um, 2,000 uh, people. Yesterday I was talking at Coventry University. So no day is ever the same for me, really. Um, and the funny thing is, yesterday whilst I was talking at Coventry University, um, and there was a queue of, I don't even know how many people wanted to chat afterwards. And then an hour later, there I am in, in my uh, shop that I own with, with my wife. One of the staff members wasn't there. And I'm washing up some shakers. You know, it's no day is ever the same, really. It can be massive highs one minute and, and washing up the next. Um, and I'm also the director of the Forward Thinking Group, which if you're interested in looking it up, it's, um, it's very similar to Ash, a group of lots of different companies from um, consultancies to lettings, training, 
um, hospitality, all sorts of other things. So that should be brief enough, Ash. Was that okay? Yeah, sure. Okay. So, right, moving on then. So why are you here? We always do this section of the webinar because it's really important to understand who we've got on the webinar, but more importantly, what's the reason you're here for? Now, I know that we've got a lot of people online. Uh, there's, I've got quite a few familiar faces here, a lot of people from the Elite Property Tribe, uh, but and I already know that background because I'm working with them for the next year. But for everyone else that's online, tell me what's the reason why you get involved in property what is it that you want to do uh, now instead of just giving us some of the answers where we're going to hear that we want to we want to be free and we want to be financially free i want to really know what your pain is why what do you need to escape what are you running away not running away but what would you like to get away from so let's let's go through some of these Someone wants to sack their boss, which is a great answer. So a lot of people want to travel, resolve financial problems, recently retired, need an income. Okay. Right, okay. Okay, so we've got quite a few varied answers there. Someone wants to get a Ferrari. Nice. Why not? Okay, quit the job and allow more time for travel and business. Right, okay. Interesting. Build a build a family business and have freedom to give back. Move to a different part of the country. Become full-time property investor using many different strategies. Let's get the rat race. Someone wants to put, have an Audi R8. Okay, someone wants to make an album. Wow, so we've got some aspired music uh, musicians. Okay. Right, okay, so interesting. So we've got quite a variety of reasons there. The reason why I ask that is because people always ask me all the time, are you involved in property? Can it really be that lucrative? And the answer is, in actual fact, I'm going to twist this around because uh, without going into this into too much detail, earlier this year I launched something, well, when I say earlier this year, two weeks ago I launched something called the Elite Property Tribe and we've taken, I think it's just, just short of 30 people on a property journey for the next year. And what I've found over the last two weeks has really, really shocked me because I've got these motivated group of 30 individuals or couples because some people are working as a, uh, as a partnership. And what they have taught me over the last couple of weeks is really outstanding me because I threw them a gauntlet that they had to, within a year, do a certain amount of deals or prove that they've done sufficient amount of deals because I'm going to be training them every week for the next 52 weeks. And some of the stuff that they have come out with so far has been outstanding. Now, one lady that we've got actually online, uh, Helen, who's with her partner, Andrew, before even starting, before even starting the program, they came to me with an outstanding deal. And I think today we've actually sold it. Just waiting on the investor to come back to us. He's reserved it and now he's going off to source some funding for it. But in that respect, we have actually sold it. And when you look at it on the on the base of it, I'll, we're not going to go into too much detail on that uh, project. And those that are on my mailing list would have seen it go out last, last uh, Friday. And on the back of that, they've made a sourcing fee of £10,000. Now, when you look at £10,000, the average wage in the UK is, I think, off memory, it's between £26 and £30,000. Let's just use the average of £30,000. Within two weeks, they've secured a third of the UK national average wage. And that's because all they've got is passion, passion passion 
and passion oozes out of these guys because they're the first per they're the first people awake in the morning they're searching they're texting me okay what can we do okay we found another deal what can we do with it yeah and i i absolutely love that and guys i know that you're online because i can see it and all i can do is applaud you guys because you really have shown me and even reinvigorated my passion for property because even myself and people like myself and neil can sometimes become complacent would you agree with that neil um i'm gonna i'm just gonna agree with you ash go for it okay. <laughs> because I, I i personally you know people would sometimes say to me ash okay with over 500 odd tenants don't you think you've got enough and I could very easily sit back and say, yes, I have. And, you know, I could live a very, very nice lifestyle without doing anything further. But I love the drive. I love the chase. I love the thought of doing the next deal. And what we're doing at the moment, and this is the whole point of doing the Elite Property Drive, is because these guys now, I can teach them something new. And more importantly, it also teaches me something new. But some of the things that we're going to be talking about today are some life-changing stuff. So... Going back to the question, can it really replace your income? You only need to do three deals a year to replace your income. Now, going on Helen's example, the one that she's done, all she, she's already done one in two weeks, and we're, we're just at the start of February. She's looking at a few others. So if she does a couple more in uh, February and March, she's recovered. Well, she's already self-employed, but she wants more. And you can do it. All we're going to do tonight is we're going to talk about some of the str sourcing strategies that we've employed, which will allow you to get your phone ringing. And now we're, comp myself and Neil, are completely different to every other sourcer that you will hear out there. Now there's lots of people teaching sourcing and predominantly everyone's talking about leaflets, bandit boards. And yes, we are going to cover leaflets this evening, but I'm going to put a bit of a spin on it. So we're going to show you how you can do it too. We've created more success stories. Well, when I say this year, it was 2015 than any other year on record. And this year in 2016, I want to smash that record. The reason why I say that everyone in the Elite Property Tribe is on fire. More importantly, I want to make sure that I turn all 30 people into deal sourcing machines and turn them into 30 success stories. Right, okay, so a brief history of time. Now, Neil, do you want to take this part? Why don't I uh, start at the beginning, Ash, and then you can, you can carry it on. So, I mean, back in, I mean, that's 2006, but back in 2005, when I first got into property, it was actually really easy to buy a property. There wasn't any of these very, very stringent checks that there are these days. Um, it wasn't, you know, you need 80%, um, you know, money and things like that. Oh, sorry, 70%. It was, it was just so simple. There was even 110% mortgages from, I think it was the Mortgage Works, if I remember rightly. So this, no joke, you, if you saw a house and it was £100,000, you could borrow £110,000 to buy that house. And then you could use that other 10,000 on top. I mean, you meant to use it for a home improvement, but you can use it for whatever you want. It was crazy. So people were able to go out and build these huge portfolios very quickly with none of their own money or, or very little of their own money. It was a crazy time. And people made a lot of money. And then at the same time, come 2008, when the crash happened, a lot of people lost a lot of money. I was quite fortunate in that I did money but I was very close to because um, you know three years into my property journey I was still very new and I'd made um, plenty of little mistakes that I don't mind you know sharing um, so that was really that was the, really the beginning back then and then coming on to 2008 was was a huge crash and I'll let Ash take over from that point okay so moving on from 2008 uh, funding became tight people uh Funding became tight and people became 
a lot of people had to exit the market uh, because when Mortgage, Mortgage Express was available uh, from 2003 to 2008, people were allowed to purchase property and refinance it the same day using the Mortgage Express same day refinance product. Now, when that disappeared, people struggled because they didn't really understand how to buy. Well, it was really tough to get finance for someone to buy property. Then they'd have to hold on to it for six months. Then they would have to try and refinance it. And the growth of getting into property became very slow. So there was a real need for something different. Now, um, for those that know my story, is that I left university at the year 2000. I went to University of Gloucestershire, which was in Cheltenham. And when I left university, I decided that I was going to get involved in property. And I looked after my father's small portfolio. And I decided to, I didn't really want to be a landlord. And so I decided I wanted to do something in property because property can be very exciting. And certainly 2016 has been an exciting year for property. There's a real sense of it's it's definitely a buyer's market at the moment. It's It's a mixture of a seller's market and a buyer's market. But the question is, where does the opportunity lie? And this is where the skill comes in. So I've been trading property for the last 15 years. So you could say that I know a thing or two about trading. I've traded thousands of property. And in 2015 alone, I traded 140 properties. And that was only from April till December. So I didn't actually do much work for the first four months of the year. So I'll be showing you uh, a bit of an example about those. But I'm not going to be talking too much about what you know, the, the kind of deals that we're doing. What I want to show is the techniques that we've employed, which allows us to get to this level of success. Now, how much does a property sell for? Now, it's, a, it's, a, it's not a difficult question to ask, but what I want to do is I want to remember I said that me and Neil are slightly different breed when it comes to deal sourcing. I've got this philosophy. If you wait for the phone to ring, you're never in control of the business. If you're the person making the phone call, you're in direct control of your sourcing. And so what we like to do, we employ lots of sourcing strategies where you're the person making the call. And so, yeah, we are going to be talking about leaflets, like I said. And we'll be going on about that. So that's why I'm a different breed of a property investor. I like to think outside the box. So here's some of the fees. Uh, and so, some people, you know, with all due respect, if you're in a standard nine to five position in a company, you'll be shocked to hear some of the, the fees that we charge. Now, a typical small property where there's very little room for growth or discount, you could charge anywhere between two and three thousand pounds. Now, a lease option, a rent to rent or a specialist area. You could charge anywhere between two and ten thousand pounds. The average property deal is around five thousand. A larger house or a small HMO could fetch anywhere between five and eight. A large HMO commercial could be ten thousand pounds upwards, and a plot of land or a development opportunity could be anything in excess. You know, can I, can I share? A, do you mind? I'm going to ask a question. Do you mind if I share? Um, a story of a piece of land that myself and Aki, uh, one of our other business partners back then, did with a piece of land. More important, it just allows me to check in with you guys just to make sure that you're still with us. So, okay, so you're still with us, I think. Yep. Okay, so, right. I've never really told this story before. And if you've read my book, Boom, Bust and Back Again, which is, by, uh, which is on Amazon, uh, you 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 will have read about this story because when we do when we talk about sourcing, generally we're talking about flipping the property, which is literally taking A and putting it to C, and your B being in the centre, being the controller. Now, uh, back back in the heydays of property, myself, Aki, and one of our other business partners, we bought a piece of land, and back then we were developers, so we were building approximately two hundred properties a year. So we had a decent sized business. We had about 40 employees, which uh, spanned right from uh, office staff, land, uh, land agents, 
uh, we had marketing agents, we had site developers, we had site staff, so and we had a pretty much a full on development company. Now we bought a piece of land which was a, for, a former uh, car showroom and it was based in Wolverhampton. Um, we had the option to purchase it subject to planning permission. We got planning permission for four, uh, sorry, it was 24 three and four bedroom townhouses. And this was when the market was still quite, still quite rich and quite buoyant. We got planning on it and the very next day we got a phone call from a supermarket and they said, we've just noticed you got planning permission on that site. Would you be interested in selling it? Bear in mind, we hadn't sold, we hadn't even bought it yet. We'd only exchanged subject to planning. And that afternoon, we made a clear £1 million profit. How crazy is that? For a site that we didn't own, and all we did, we applied for planning permission, and we cleared a million pounds off it. But that's what we talk about, the plot of land and the development opportunities. That's where you got the large blue chip companies. Obviously, we had a lot of good things going for the site. It was in the right, it was in the right location. It was the right size of land. It was everything that ticked their box. But if you've got the vision, our vision was never to turn it into a supermarket. And I don't mind saying that. It was actually Lidl that came knocking on our door. Uh, we got approached by Sainsbury's and in actual fact, we had two supermarkets actually in pretty much like a little bidding war. So it, it can be very lucrative and development plots can be extremely profitable, but you've got to make sure that you, they all stack up. So I've gone completely off, off track on that. So Neil, I'm going to pass it back over to you. So here's some of the statistics of, okay, it looks like, uh, the tail end of 2015. Neil, can you tell us a little bit about some of the deals that we did here? Yeah, okay. Um, I mean, this was probably my best month in sourcing, which was back in August. Now, again, um, as Arsh has mentioned, <clears throat> we have very different strategy. My strategy is more um, smaller figures where I'm not too too greatly involved in the transaction. I'm, I'm I'm sort of like the middleman, but I'm off to the side. So I'll facilitate a buy and a sell without getting involved. Whereas Arsh usually sits in the middle. So his contracts are more creative. So he's buying and selling almost at the same time on the same day, um, which is a little bit more complicated, but it makes three or four times the amount that I do. Um, so this is what, we, what I did back in August um, last year. So the first deal was a property. It was an investor source deal. And this came from a uh, vehicle uh, wrap, so you'll see this shortly. So this was a wrap I had in my car. It took about seven hours of work altogether. I got £3,000 from the investor, who was the buyer, and I got uh, £1,200 from the seller. So that was pretty much you know, like if you were an estate agent, you sold a house for someone. Um, so I just put them together. So the fee on that was £4,200 for seven hours of work. That was all it was. The second one was a rent-to-rent -rent deal, and it was actually in my own city, but at the time it was an area that I didn't really want to go into because I already had uh, my strategy. So my rent-to-rent -rent strategy is, is quite um, unique, and this didn't fall in with my, um, my strategy. So I actually sold this one on to somebody else, and that was just shy of £2,000. Next slide, Ash. Okay, I also bought and sold an, uh, my own property um, in that month, and I got £2,000 from the buyer because I, I packaged it up as an investment, which is actually really nice when you know how to create a little brochure and you know how to put all the, all the statistics and the return investment and things. People will absolutely snap your hand off. So that was a large cash out for me as well um, because I had refurbished it. And the last deal I did, which was quite an interesting one, was this was a lease option which is a little bit more complicated than your normal buy and sell. Um, and this came from a tradesman, which we're going to be talking about again in one of the strategies that I, I use to source. This is about 12 hours work in total. I got £5,000 from the buyer because, again, it was a very nice deal. 
and I got seven and a half thousand pounds from the seller because I structured it in the way Ash does all of his deals. So it was a lot more work, but I did make probably three times what I would have done if I hadn't. So that was twelve thousand pounds. So if you add all of the all of that up, it was um, it was a very big month. It was probably double the national um, average just in one month. It, it really was a crazy month. And Ash has touched on this, but deal sourcing, there isn't really anything else like it in terms of making large, um, sort of large amounts of cash very quickly and easily. I know I mentioned rent to rent, which is another strategy I do. And that's good for sustainable income. Every month you know that income's coming in, it's sustainable, and you can build it up nicely. Deal sourcing is more for big lump sums. Um, it, it, it's not quite as sustainable. You've got to keep your marketing going all the time, constantly. Um, and if you do that, you'll get deals here and there. But it's like the seasons. Sometimes it's summer, sometimes it's winter. You can't change that. It's it's just life. So, um, Ash, back to you. Okay. Now, um, those that are on... Right, okay. Sorry, I'm just having a quick look, and so a couple of people said that the sound had gone there, and someone said that it's been breaking up. Can you just quickly check in with you guys again, please? Just make sure that you can hear us nicely and loudly and clearly. Okay, brilliant. So everyone says that they can hear us great. Okay, so here's a deal now. Those that are on my deal database will would have seen this deal sitting on their email to today actually this morning so i went out where was i last week i went out and saw this property i think it was wednesday last week when was i up in huddersfield i think it was sorry tuesday last week and it was a deal that i got approached by an investor who is based in london unfortunately they've had a few issues with some of the trades people who had lost control of the job and it's a 26 bedroom HMO in Nelson now here's the interesting thing is that he was interested in doing not a straight out purchase because he still loved the property but he was interested in doing something called a lease option now when you're a deal sourcer you can throw in there a completely different set of tools so there's lots of ways of purchasing properties. There's lots of ways of acquiring property. Now, with this one, we agreed a 10-year lease option. And what we calculated and what I calculated is that for the first three years, it would cash flow at £3,000 a month as a 26-bed HMO. And because we structured it on a 10-year lease option for the next seven years, it, because the rent had to go up slightly, it would then cash flow at £2,120. But the interesting thing is that the cash flow of this property over 10 years was going to be producing £290,000. Now, tell me, where else are you going to find a property for free where someone's willing to hand you the keys? Remember, we're still talking about deal sourcing where someone's willing to hand you the keys and say, Arsh, take control of the property for the next 10 years. As long as you give me X per month, I want to make sure as long as I'm guaranteed X per month, you can have the rest. And when I calculated what it would work, whether it would work for me or whether it would work for one of my investors, that's what it's going to cash flow over 10 years. That's after all costs. So that's after the rent. That's after the utilities. That's after 15% plus VAT management charge. That's after taking into consideration 10% voids and bad debt and maintenance. So £290,000 cash flow from a property that I don't own, I refuse to own, but just simply control. But more importantly, I've decided that I won't keep this deal. All I'm doing is I'm packaging it up and sold it. I've sold it today 
onto one of my investors and we made a £10,000 sourcing fee on it. Now, from that point of view, you've got to ask that. ten grand again, going back to a point, what's the national average wage? It's thirty grand. I've made a third of a national average wage within a week. Going to see it last Tuesday, actually putting it out today and selling it today. So it can happen. Now I'm going to pass you back over to Neil because we're going to start to look at the, the marketing strategies that we put in place for some, some of these deals. So but Neil, back over to you. Okay, great. So now we're going to get onto the content slot. And I know that Arsh has promised you five. We usually do three. So this is a big one. He's promised you five deal sourcing strategies that we both use. So the first one is is probably one of my biggest strategies which is newspaper adverts and when I was first told about newspaper adverts I wasn't convinced at all because I'd done a fair bit of direct marketing um, I'd done a lot of newspaper advertising and in my opinion it was dying but the interesting thing is a lot of the P when you, whenever you're advertising or you're doing any marketing the thing that most people make this mistake on is they don't put themselves in the, the mind, in the head of the, of the customer. So think about this for a second. Who owns most properties? What sort of age group? Is it 18-year-old kids that are on Facebook or Twitter or Instagram all day? Or is it 40, 50, 60, 70-year-olds? It's the latter. And what does that age group still do? They read newspapers. So I was, I was um, listening to someone recently who teaches sourcing saying, oh, I've been doing really well from Instagram and Facebook and Twitter. And I just sat there and thought, I don't think you have, mate, really, because the, the target market isn't on those platforms. So I actually tested it. I got my marketing people within my office to test that. And we put so much time and effort in. We didn't get a single response back. Um, well, actually, we got one girl that said, my dad... Um, asked me what this is about when I told him about a property. But out of thousands of sort of posts and things like that, we got one thing back. It was it was just pointless. So with the newspaper adverts, your target market is there straight away. You don't really need to do a great deal. They read the newspaper every day. So I'm going to give you a couple of tips now for a good newspaper advert. Number one, it's a myth to put in a big one page or double page spread and pay thousands of pounds expecting to get lots of leads from it. It's a complete myth that the advertising people created so that you'd spend a lot of money. The actual truth is you're far better putting in uh, an advert this size that you can see on screen so just very small, what's that, probably three columns by three and paying 50 pounds and running that every week for eight weeks rather than paying a thousand pounds once. So it's all about consistency. There's an age old saying that people need to see something seven times before they even take notice of it. And it's, it's very true. The next point is this. You need to make your advert simple and clean. Again, it's a, it's a, big, it's a big thing people do where they make their advert really cluttered or their business card really cluttered. You know, so many people pass me their business card all the time and it says property investor, deal sourcer, rent to rent expert, uh, developer, investor, you know, all this other stuff. And I just think, what are you? Because it's the same, you know, if you ever call a plumber and he says, oh, I'm a plumber, electrician, builder and gardener, you, the whole credibility has gone straight away. And the same is true in advertising. So the main thing you need to do is keep it really clean. So let's take the top left advert here where it says currently offering 0% management fee for the first six months. So I don't know who put that out, but it's obviously a letting agent. Now if you look at it, it's really clean. Currently, you know, the 0% is huge, that's their main headline. Um, currently offering 0% management fee for the first six months. Properties required urgently. We have many tenants awaiting rental accommodation now. So that's a fairly good advert. What they've missed is the H1 tag, which basically is your headline. It's the, it's the main thing people look at. Now a good one would have been attention landlords because then 
straight away a landlord's going to see that oh I am a landlord why, why do I need to give this advert my attention it then goes into we're currently offering 0% management fee okay that that's great because I don't like paying a management fee properties required urgently we have tenants waiting okay great so straight away if I'm a landlord I'm gonna say this looks good because they've got tenants waiting and I've got a property so I'm not gonna have any voids so can you see the power of that advert now let's go across to the right now this is a deal source I don't know who flying homes are I've never heard of them but it's very this is a very good advert because it says cash 24 hours in yellow so they're probably targeting people who desperately need money they might be in financial burden maybe they're gonna lose their property or anything like that so it says cash house buyer in 24 hours up to 100 uh, percent value it's got the phone number really clearly and the website it also says all fees paid instant quote um, and then the last bullet point is actually terrible because it says Google flying homes so th their target market won't know what that means what they're saying is to a, 50, to a let's say a 70 year old go on to the internet type into Google flying homes but of course their target market would never know that so apart from that that's a pretty good advert and then the middle one promote your business book online ad book newspaper ad okay it's not the best but the point is here they've used three really strong colors which is your red your yellow and your black okay so keeping it really simple and consistent every week is the key to sourcing plenty of deals let's go on to the second one Ash okay so Ash put in his email about car wraps or car magnets and things like that so I'm just going to mention what I did briefly so this is the um, company I founded it's called easy property sales now what I've just done is I have sold this to a student of mine who lives in Coventry and now what's going to be happening is he's going to be sourcing all of the, the deals and we're now in partnership so I'm going to be selling them through my property investment company so let me explain how this works and it's, it's, it's it, we're doing a split basically so what you do is you get yourself a car or two cars now these cars weren't expensive and um, the Fiesta was when I bought it was about three thousand pounds in front the one to the rear is a Fiesta Fusion so again a Ford it was about five and a half grand they both had about ten thousand miles on the clock so very low mileage you don't need to spend that much on cars you can pick up a car for 500 pounds if you really want to and a wrap like that that I've done there doesn't cost a lot you're probably talking 200 pounds if you do a full car wrap you can spend a thousand pounds it's a lot of money and it's not needed you don't need to do that at all now what Paul does on his vans and things like this so he now has these cars and what he also has is vans and vans are metal so he uses magnetic big signs and he just sticks them on the side of his vans and he's got some other cars as well so now if you were to go around Coventry you would see these cars he's probably got five or six of these um, vehicles now all wrapped up just driving around constantly and you'd be surprised how many phone calls you get from it now originally when I wrapped the cars they didn't get many phone calls at all and I couldn't figure it out so what I did was I just went for a completely crazy strategy and I made them look um, very different so you can see now they look very colorful and bright and then their cars got known around as the smarty cars so I'm not sure how or why but kids used to say oh it's the smarty cars and you know probably five or six kids would say that and then the parents would look at it and it would get attention and we did get a lot of calls um, I can't remember how many calls a week we would get but we did get a lot of leads from this so wrapping your car if you can is a really effective strategy and I say if you can because I know that some people you know you might still be in a day-to-day nine-to-five job <clears throat> um, you know one of the guys who who's done really well now was a surgeon and he wanted to retire from being a surgeon and he said no I can't wrap up my you know luxury vehicle and drive that to work um, so I know it's not possible for everyone but what you can do is just buy a 500 pound car tax it and leave it on the side of the road there's nothing against that there's no law against that um, so as long as it's in, in a place that there isn't any rules that you can't park there that vehicle is going to get you a lot of attention especially if people see it every day on their drive to or from work 
Okay, let's go on to the next one, Ash, unless you've got anything to add. No, I think you've covered it there. Okay. So this is my third strategy, which I think, in fairness, is probably the, the one that generates me the most leads. And this is my army of tradesmen. And I know that a lot of people have come around to this idea and teach this now. And I really stumbled across this idea many years ago, where um, I won't go into the full story, but I, I basically was talking to a tradesman about what I was doing um, in terms of the sourcing, the investing, the rent to rents, etc. And from that, he just said, Well, I know someone with loads of empty houses. And from that conversation, he put me in touch with somebody and it turned out to be very lucrative and I, I gave him I gave him some cash, the sourcer who was a builder, and I think I gave him two hundred or it might have been two hundred and fifty pounds cash. And then he obviously from there he was always bringing me deals. And then I thought, well that's a really good idea. Why don't I see if any of my other tradesmen would be interested in that? So the next thing I did was to call up my plumber, my electrician, my you know, everybody I could think of decorators, etc. And before I knew it, I was getting more and more and more and more leads coming to me all the time. And at that point, it, I didn't need to spend any money on marketing or advertising because I had so many leads, especially in the summer, which is very interesting. It's, it's, a, it's quite bizarre, but in the summer, you seem to get five times the amount of leads. Does it mean that there's five times the amount of houses or people needing the money? No. It's just in the winter, we live in the UK, and people in the winter tend to hibernate and bury their head under the, uh, their covers when it comes to problems. As soon as summer comes around and the sun's out and everything's great, they want to deal with these problems. So you'll find that as well. In the winter, you won't get as many leads, and it's a lot slower to get things moving. But come spring and summer, things just accelerate like a rocket and I was getting so many leads coming to me that I couldn't do anything with a lot of them because I just did not have the manpower or the staff um, or the mental capacity because of the stress to actually deal with the amount of houses that were coming to me. So a lot of them um, we, we were just sourcing on to investors or other people that were sourcers that went off and sold them and we still got our 50% split. So this is a fantastic strategy where you'll all have at least one tradesman in your phone book. Maybe it was that plumber that fixed a leaky tap for you one day, or the electrician that came out when the fuse board blew. Um, everybody has at least one tradesman in your phone book. And the interesting thing with tradesmen is they won't be thinking about you 24-7 every day of the week because they've got their own business to take care of. Most of them are self-employed. So you do have to follow up with them regularly maybe every four, six, eight weeks. Some, some tradesmen I don't follow up for three months at a time, but you've got to follow up with them because they're not thinking about you all the time. But as soon as you mention the cash incentive, they are, they're away again. They're, they want to get that cash because that sort of money is uh, quite a nice incentive to a tradesman, £250 worth of cash um, or even lower. It depends on the tradesman. The window cleaner, I offer him £20, and he's he's more than happy. Whereas the builder, I have to offer him £250. <laughs> so, you know, you, you've just got to think about the different people you know um, and, and, and who you could speak to, basically. So, Ash, I'll hand over to you to cover the last two. Okay, so for those that know me, now, admittedly, this is a bit of a raw subject for me because... I know so many people talk about leaflets, leaflets, and goddamn bloody leaflets. Uh, and they always say that you should put out leaflets, and you've got to keep putting out leaflets, and make sure you put out leaflets, and once you've finished leafleting, you should put some more out. Now, the average response rate for a leaflet is around 1%, which means that if you want a decent amount of return, you've got to put out a lot of leaflets. 10,000 leaflets will get you, is it? Uh, 10,000 leaflets will get you 100 responses, is that right? Yeah, 10,000 leaflets will get you 100 responses. I think, Ash, actually, it's massively dropped now. So some of the latest industry standards say it can be as low as 0.1%. 
um, especially in our sort of market. So you can, um, I remember when I did a leaflet drop a, a long time ago and I did 10,000, I got 10 responses from that, not 100. So it really does depend on the area as well, which I'm, I'm sure you'll mention. But, yeah. Um, you, yeah, go ahead. Okay, so with with leaflets, like I say, you've got to put out a lot of risk, a lot of leaflets out there. But my biggest gripe with leaflets is that you never know: a, are they being delivered in the space in the places that you want them to? B, you're never going to know when the phone's going to ring. And again, you've got to be putting out leaflets. And then, as Neil said, you don't just put the leaflets out once and expect a load, a load of phone calls. You've got to go and litter it again and litter it again. Until people actually get the hint that, yes, you're serious and you're in the area and you're the person to go to. And I know this because uh, when I started uh, one of my companies, which I'm going to show you shortly, is that I actually went through a campaign where I spent near enough the best part of £100,000 a month on marketing. And we were put in every single publication within the West Midlands. So regardless where you went, you saw us. Uh, and I'll, I'll be talking about how we expanded that slightly going forward. So the, the lady that you'll notice on the left-hand side, she's quite well known in the property industry because she actually creates these ad, uh, She actually creates these um, leaflets. Her name's Susie Bates, and she, she's a lovely lady, and you know she can create you a cracking leaflet. For me, leaflets are great, but leaflets are good if you want to put out some positive news. Personally, I wouldn't tag leaflets being as your nut or wouldn't put your hinge or your hopes on leaflets the good thing about leaflets is that you get to create or you get to cover a mass market and all you really need is one deal to cover back the cost of the leaflets the problem that you've got with leaflets it can be very time consuming you've got to design them you've got to get them printed got to find someone to distribute them you've got to make sure that they have been distributed and then you've got the waiting game so that's that's my biggest gripe with leaflets uh, and like i said unfortunately with a leaflet you don't know w whether they're being distributed with a uh, they're distributed into a property where it's vacant. You don't know whether they're going into the correct letterboxes. You don't know if they're going into rented properties and then they just ended up in the bin. Are they just ended up in the pile of junk mail? So you don't actually, that's my biggest issue with leaflets. Moving forward, what, one thing that I found was quite successful actually is actually advertising on takeaway menus. But again, my biggest gripe was that was Yes, okay, it will end up in the drawer with all the other takeaway menus. And the reason why, you know, I'm probably sounding positive but negative in respect of the last two strategies is because I've kind of moved away from this form of marketing where it's pretty much like mass marketing. I'm very much more targeted towards direct marketing, almost like playing battleships. It's almost like a direct hit understanding where the property is, uh, how to approach the property, how to diagnose a property. Diagnose, that's a great word, yeah. Uh, how to diagnose a property, how to, but more importantly, structure the property. Now, takeaway menus, again, are great because it can be cheap, but more importantly, they can go into a lot of hands. One thing that you should do is that if you are going to do a takeaway menu, make sure you choose a popular restaurant because I've seen so many restaurants out there which is so substandard that even if you were the greatest company advertising on the back of it, it would still end up in the bin just purely because of the standard of the restaurant. So that's just something to take into consideration. And it can actually be quite cost effective, anything from like £5 a week. Uh, it just all depends on the on the company that you're dealing with. So I've done it. It's worked. It's worked for us in the past, but it's it's not something that I would produce going forward. So the other strategies that Neil has spoken about, like the tradespeople, the cars, and the 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 newspaper adverts, are definitely more effective, in my humble opinion, than the takeaway menus and certainly the leaflets. Because, like I said, the one thing that I don't like with leaflets is that you're never hundred percent sure which hands they're falling into. So 
Um, moving on, but why would people buy deals directly from me? Neil, I'll tell you what, I'm going to let you take this one. Okay. Yeah, great. I mean, this is a, a big question that comes up all the time. People say, you know, it, it's great what you and Ash do, but I don't think I could do it because I don't know how I could sell the house, you know, sell these deals. Um, you know, who would buy them from me and why? So here's, here's the interesting thing. Most of the people that buy property deals are not like you or I or Ash. They don't have knowledge on, on property. These the sort of people are accountants, they're doctors, they're people that work in you know finance or the medical profession or you know another another profession where they had to go through university for several years. These are the I'd say make up ninety percent of the people who buy investment property. Now, these people are working nine to five, usually a lot more than nine to five. They're they're very stressed out. There's a lot of pressure on them all the time. Um, they usually have families as well, so they're constantly, constantly busy, and they don't really have that time to look into investments, what to invest in, what's a good thing, do I invest in stocks and shares, or what, what should I invest into? So the easy option is to invest in property, and that's why most go down that route. The next thing to, to touch on here is banks and the interest rates. Does anyone know what interest rates are being offered at the moment? They are absolutely tiny. And it was really funny. I was in the bank the other week. It was Lloyd's Bank, actually. And there was this old lady, and she looked about 90 years old. Not joking. And she was saying to this man in, in, in the bank, basically, oh, you know, about I've come in about my bank account. I'm only getting 0.25% interest, it says here. And I'm not joking you. The man said... Well, we can change your bank account and, and um, put you into a better saving rate, but it's a lot of work. You're going to have to cancel this. You're going to have to, you know, remember the new bank account details. Um, but I can certainly get you at least 0.5 or 0.75% interest. And she said, oh, is that, is that good? It doesn't sound like a lot. And he went, yeah, that's good. If you compare that to other banks, that's, that's quite good, <laughs> right? Now, to me, I was stood there laughing because I thought, this is absolutely crazy. Half a percent interest or 0.75 percent interest. Inflation would be eating away at your money just at those sort of rates. You know, I would never invest money at anything less than 10 percent. That's just the way I operate. In fact, buying into something like a rent-to-rent -rent deal, you're looking at 360 percent return per year. It's, it's the highest return ever. Deals, deal sourcing. Every pound you put into advertising, you're probably going to make a hundred pounds back. You know, a hundred percent, a thousand percent return. It's just crazy the sort of returns. Um, what's a good return to these people then, who we talked about, the doctors, the accountants, anybody else that that works a nine to five? A good return is anything over five percent, pretty much. If you look at the industry statistics and data. Most people in that category, if, as long as they're getting 5%, they're happy with that sort of a return. So if you go in and you offer a deal like I showed you earlier, and someone can make themselves 8%, 10%, even more than that, they're going to bite your hand off. And, oh, okay, Mr. Jones, Mr. Smith, it's actually £5,000 to buy this deal from me. They might think, £5,000? But then as soon as you show them what they're going to be making, a return, so if they buy something for 100000 and they're making 10000 a year, making a 10% return. So they're making their money back very, very quickly. Okay. And the next thing is the pension pot. Again, that lady that I, that I mentioned, her money is going to be dwindling. All the It's not going to be going up. You know, it's, it's going to be just... Uh, how do you build a pension in this day and age? Nothing is guaranteed in the in the workplace, the nine to five workplace. That pension pot is not guaranteed. Um, how do you build a pension pot? Well, it's through owning property. So if you can sell that to the investors that you work with, they're going to be chasing you for deals all the time. So that's who would buy them, and that's why they would buy them from you.
Next slide, Ash. Okay, so the next point then, all of this is great, but how do you actually make a business out of all of this? Well, this is where it gets a little bit more complicated. We've covered the easy stuff, um, and then this is where it gets a bit more difficult. The legalities of this are very complex if you don't know how to do it. Ash and I have mastered this now. We've got all the legal, we've got all the contracts, we've got everything there is there. Um, but it took a long time. It took us years to get to this stage and thousands upon thousands of pounds in legal fees to get these things. So that's the first thing you need. You need the legals. You need to understand how to put deals together. You need the creative ability to actually, um, when you see a deal that others have looked at and they've dismissed, knowing how you can do something with that and package it up. The next thing you need to do is do a lot of research. So you've got to research your area in depth. You've got to find out what people are looking for, what's a good return, which houses give a good return. And it amazes me the amount of landlords that just go out and spend, you know, let's take Coventry for example, you can pick up a really decent house that will make you a fantastic return for £130,000. Hey, near, to, near to the university, £130,000. Yet some landlords will go out and they'll spend double that and they'll make half the amount that the £130,000 house is making because they'll rent it to a family whereas the, the first landlord is now getting it rented to students and making a fortune. You see, that's the difference. You've got to research and understand your area and the different types of property. Next, um, business presence, you've got to build up a presence. You've got to build up your brand so that people get used to your brand and that's, that's also key. Leads we've talked about, that's the marketing and advertising. Ash and I have a huge mind map of absolutely, well there's probably over a hundred strategies on that mind map of how to source leads and deals. Um, so that's the next thing to master. Ash has got an in investor database, a huge one. So myself, I don't even use a, a big database. I've got a very small database of people who are high net worth that will always buy property deals from me. Ash has got, it's got tens of thousands on his, which is why he sells his deals so quickly and you've got to snap them up before they're gone. And the last thing is you've got to know how to make the sale. So you've got to have a little bit of um, intelligence about you, just got to figure out how to package it and how to present it and how to sell it. So you've got to have a little bit of sales skills, but not a great deal. Um, and as long as you've got all these things, you'll be very successful. Next slide, Ash. So these are the two companies I founded at, at the same time. The first one is Easy Property Sales, which as I said, I've now sold that to a student who we've, we're now going 50-50 basically. So any deals he'll bring to me and I'll sell them through my investor database. So you saw at the beginning I own the Forward Thinking Group. One of the companies within the group is Forward Thinking Property, which is a sourcing business for landlords, investors, high net worth individuals. Now predominantly it used to be UK individuals, but what's happened is very, um, not strange, but interesting in the last few years. I say the last two to three years uh, predominantly is the market's completely changed. It's gone from mainly UK people to now being a lot of Chinese, um, a lot of Middle Eastern, even some people from South America who want to invest in the UK in property. So I'll, I'll pass over to Ash for the next slide. Okay, so remember I said that back in uh, 2000, I set up a company called We Buy Properties Fast, and always when I do these webinars, I will take my website offline just purely because we will get a lot of people on the webinar who will now go and try and create online inquiries, which means that tomorrow morning our staff would always be inundated with lots of inquiries. So I set up a company called We Buy Properties Fast, and as Neil said that, uh, a lot of competitors or a lot of people put adverts in the back of the papers. And once that used to be me. So what I decided to do is take it one step further. And I actually created High Street Presence. So here's my office in Chapel Ash in Wolverhampton. And it's the one of the first and probably still one of the main High Street Presence property purchasing office 
offices in the UK. So what made my what made my company slightly different is that whereas people were operating off a one uh, off a mobile phone as a one man band in the back of the paper, I could say to them, I'll tell you what, guys. Tell you what, uh, why don't you come over to our office? We'll have a cup of coffee. Uh, we can have a chat about your property issues and see what solution we can come up with it. And people absolutely love that. Now, you've got to remember that before this, I was spending the best part of 100 grand a month on marketing, whereas now this office sees so much traffic. We're on one of the main high streets in Wolverhampton. Uh, we're on one of the main streets in Wolverhampton, which sees so much footfall and passing traffic. Now, this office only cost me 12 grand a year in rent, which is equivalent to a thousand pound a month, which is generating me more leads than any other advertising media that a medium that we've ever had. But more importantly, it builds rapport, it builds a trust with the customer or the homeowner or the investor who's looking to source stock that, yes, I'm not going to disappear tomorrow. I've built up a massive database a database on the basis that people now trust who we are and what we do. We can't close tomorrow. We can't just switch off our mobile phone tomorrow. We're still here. We've got a legal commitment to this property. So uh, yeah, so I've been I've been I've been in this office space for a long time, nearly ten years now, uh, and it's worked extremely well. And we'll continue to keep buying properties through this method. Uh, and one of my one of my thoughts for the next few years is potential franchise this out. So it all sounds easy enough, but where can I all learn this stuff? And the reason why we say that is because we've just given you the formula of how to build your very own property sourcing business. It's a lot easier said than done, and we want to help you with this. When I say that is because there's with all due respect, there's only so much that we can fit into one hour. But how about if you'd like to align yourself with us and we give you the opportunity to work with us? And here's how. What we're doing is I appreciate that it is extremely short notice. It's this weekend. We're running a deal source, deal sourcing workshop and business weekend this weekend. The reason why I say that is because at the start of the year, so many people say that 2016 is going to be your year. We're going to do this in 2016. We're going to do that in 2016. Now, I've already got a committed group group of people on the Elite Property Journey site, uh, Elite Property Tribe Journey. Now, they're extremely committed, and I'm seeing the results through their progress and their research every day. Now, what we want to do is get you guys to become your own deal sourcing machines where you can learn everything that Neil and I know over a course of a weekend of the 13th to 14th of February. It's going to be held at the De Vere Hotel in Coventry. And the reason why we kept it such short notice is because if we give it you two months in the line, you're never going to think, well, you're going to do this. So what we're saying is that whilst we've got you focused, why don't you come on and learn everything that we know that we know and put it instill it into your mind. So on the 13th, which is a Saturday, we'll look at what the most effective 10 strategies are, which is the 20% that brings in the 80% of the deals and which are the most profitable. We'll also look at learning how an abundance of, sort of sourcing strategies and how to build your marketing plan in-house and look at discovering exactly how to write effective copy for your adverts and increasing your response rate, as well as swiping all the leaflets and the adverts and media that we've been using previously. I appreciate, Peter, it's Valentine's weekend, so here's a treat. Bring your partner for free. And I've said that way far too early. Uh, bring it, it's Valentine's weekend. Why don't you bring your partner? She will absolutely love it. Uh, love it. And more importantly, isn't it great to be on a journey as a couple, as opposed to an individual, which can be quite lonely and boring sometimes. Second part of the Saturday is that we'll be looking at the legals, how to use the right contracts, the sales, the exclusivity agreements, the NDA option agreements, and much more. How to find and build up an investor database and how to work with estate agents, have them take you seriously, calling you with deals. And more important, how to work with commercial agents and how to keep some of the deals for yourself 
with no money down or no money left in. Now on the Sunday, which is the 14th, and I appreciate it's Valentine's Day, we'll be looking at how you can turn this into a business, how to build your website, how to use the templates, what templates to use, how to create a highly responsive video to generate leads, how to use social media to the best of your advantage, how to build your team, and how to recruit the right staff so that it's not crippling you by creating the overhead. And the final thing is how to systemize the business, how to make it so that it is pretty much running itself. We'll also have a tax planning specialist, a tax plan, uh, a tax planning specialist who will be giving you a special content rich talk on how to save, how to leave the money in your pocket and not pay in tax legally, how to look at profit and loss and the forecasting how to set up a virtual office. Now, not all of you have to have to set up offices like mine, but you can do it using virtual office space. How to create trade connections, which is what Neil spoke about with the trade team and the and the workmen on the roads who can pretty much act as like your little warriors on the ground. More importantly, and this is the most important thing, is you're going to have a wonderful experience, a weekend away, which is going to be a lot of fun and a lot of laughs. More importantly, if it is Valentine's and you don't have a partner, what better way, instead of moping around in your property at home, why not come out and spend it with us? So it's the 13th and 14th of Feb. Again, it is at the De Vere Hotel in uh, Coventry. And here's some of the last courses that we ran, which you can see that it's quite a large group, but we're keeping it extremely small. Now, the one thing that we are going to be throwing in there tonight is our marketing and deal sourcing mind maps, which is basically everything that we do, we put it into a mind map scenario so that you can see these too. Where, is it, where do we get our leaflets? What kind of leaflets do we put out? What size are they? What font are they? What color are they? Why do we put them that color? It all goes into the detail of the marketing deal source in my map. And the most important thing of all is that by coming on our workshops, you get all the documentation that we use on a day-to-day -day basis as an added bonus. So we give those to you for absolutely free. So that includes the mind maps. That includes you know, documents such as the watertight and legally binding agreements our exclusivity agreements, our NDA agreements, and so much more. So it is this weekend, and it's a special offer, but just for tonight's action takers, what we're going to do is, what you're going to be getting is the deal sourcing training, the business building training, the sourcing contracts, the legal documents, the templates and the letters, the key to success, the three-course meal on both days, membership to secret group afterwards a one-on-one -on -one call with neil as well as lifetime support because the education doesn't just stop in the room you get to speak to neil and i uh, via our facebook social media groups and as well as that you've got our mobile numbers as well which is well in excess of five thousand pounds worth of benefits we only have 12 seats available for this weekend and if you are extremely if you are extremely uh, dedicated, you're able to JV with the likes of Neil and I, where we can potentially sell the deals through my database and Neil will potentially assist in the negotiations. Now, I've got a lot of exclusivity with my database with the Elite Property Tribe. So Neil and I can assist you and we can also help help you with source the deals. Now, normally you would see this for £1,200, but we are doing it for 995 per person for the whole weekend. And the reason why you did it for 995 we appreciate it is very short. Uh, it's a very short time scale and you've only got a couple of days. But more importantly, what we're going to allow you to do is bring a business partner for free. So that's you and a business partner or your partner. So bring your girlfriend, bring your wife. More importantly, it's Valentine's weekend. You get to stop in a lovely hotel. You get to have dinner with them in the evening. And it's back to business on the Sunday. So 
you've got to have a look at what it's going to do on your return investment because 995 could be potentially 20% of the commission that you make on your first deal which could any be anywhere between a 3 and 5k fee so remember we talked earlier about what do you what do you need what's the sufficient income for you to leave your current job or your current position now a lot of people would say anywhere between 20 and 50,000 pounds which is completely realistic and it is it is possible through deal sourcing now i appreciate that this may be short notice for quite a few of you we've got well we've got a lot of people online so what we have done is neil and i spoke just before this webinar i said well what do we what do we say to the people that can't make it this weekend and very simply we've put on another one which is a few months away so it's in may on the 7th and 8th of may in 2016 so if you can't attend what we are going to do is open out the offer so that you can bring a business partner for free on the 7th and 8th of may now one thing i am going to quickly mention is i've got him actually online i've just noticed that he's here a young gentleman to the name of nick hoggings he's i hope you don't mind me mentioning you nick but Nick is another great example of how someone who has was I could say it was a little bit shy in property, but by understanding the basics of sourcing, and remember we're only in week two of his training, he found a landlord who was potentially going to allow him to do a lease option on 30 properties all in one go. And I can go on and I can go on and I can go on about people who are doing this day in, day out, who are making an extremely good living just by sourcing property. When you're sourcing property, you don't physically own the property. You're trading it. You're taking it from A and you're passing it to B and you're acting right in the center. You're pretty much like a glorified estate agent. So funds-wise, if you're worried about do you need a lot of money to source property, no, you don't. Now, here's what we're going to do. If that's of interest to you, by all means, this is my personal mobile number. You can call me on it and we can reserve your space tonight. Remember, we've only got 12 spaces. And if you're bringing a couple, that re reduces it down to six spaces. I'm a little bit... I'm a little bit worried because you haven't asked many questions this evening, which is quite strange for a webinar. So we have got a bit of time. So if there are any questions, feel free to ask them now uh, because I appreciate we have run slightly over as we normally try and finish between 9 and 10 past. We are slightly over, but this is your opportunity. What, what do you... So someone's asked a question straight away. What absolutely, sorry, I don't understand the question. The question was, what absolutely is web, website marketing? What absolutely is website marketing? If you can come back to me with a slightly more detailed question, I'm more than happy to answer it. So, okay, what about website marketing? Right. Website marketing is great. One thing that you've got to slightly be concerned with is that you go to Google and you type in We Buy Properties Fast because I've got such a generic company name, I will never, ever, ever possibly even make the first page on Google. The reason we, being is that I would have to spend an absolute fortune in SEO research, which is search engine optimization research. I would probably have to spend in excess of £10,000 a month just to stay on page one. And I have to calculate now, is that the best use of my resources? Or could I use that money elsewhere on such as some of the strategies that we've spoken about tonight to generate leads? So I hope that helps. Um, 
Now, Sean's asked, if you find a deal, why can't someone just go direct to a landlord after they see the deal cutting you out? Now, that's a great question, Sean. And the reason why uh, they can't is because we've got lots of documents that we get the vendor to sign, which gives us exclusivity or an option on the property. So technically, we've got exclusivity to that, to that property for a certain period of time. That could be anything from seven days right up to three months, depending on the complexity of the deal. So, um, okay, so I'm just quickly going through the question. So hopefully that that's answered your question. Um, so I'm just quickly going through. So you're very shy on questions, if I'm going to be admitted there. Eh? So Steve has asked a question, is that... Uh, are we covering, is is this week's seminars going to be covered on the Elite Property Tribe? Well, Steve, I'm actually covering this on tomorrow night's training session. So don't be so panicked on that, my friend. So we're going to, if there's any other any other questions, by all means, you're, you're a very shy bunch this evening. I'm worried that we've either taken this completely over your head or you've completely got everything in in-house and you've taken it all on board. Now, just moving on, you've got Neil's mobile number there as well, which also you've got his Facebook and you've got his LinkedIn details. So by all means, if you want to have a chat with Neil, you're more than welcome to. As well as, again, you can find me on Twitter, Facebook, LinkedIn, as well as YouTube. We've got lots of different videos out on YouTube. So there's lots of educational tips for you to, to take on board from YouTube, uh, as well as you can find me on my personal website. Um, So yeah, okay. So here's here's a good question. So, uh, so Michael's asked, is there a payment plan for the May course, say three instalments? What we can do, Michael, if it helps, then yes, that's what we can do. So we can split it over three payments of three hundred and thirty and three hundred and forty pounds. So if that helps. Yes, by all means, get in contact with me. Then my mobile number is on screen at the moment. Send me a text, and what we'll do, we'll have a chat after this webinar. Um, agents asking a question what's your opinion of bandit boards when we're talking about bandit boards I'm assuming we're talking about the yellow corex boards which people put up on land lampposts now I know a lot of people teach this strategy and it's it's a good strategy it's also, um, when I say, it's also a risky strategy because you've got to put certain things in place to make sure that you don't get caught because technically technically speaking, if you were to put those bandit boards up in Wolverhampton, you would get prosecuted. I know that because I was very, very close to on the verge of being prosecuted because uh, back in the early 2000s, everyone, and this was not only property purchasing companies, but even... Um, now, I know that I was in London on Sunday, and you still see it that a lot of nightclubs still use bandit boards on um, on lampposts and traffic lights. And I'm surprised that they don't get penalised. But back in the early 2000s, if you went around Wolverhampton, I don't suppose there was a specific lamppost that didn't have a bandit board on so Wolverhampton created blanket policy that anyone where there was a bandit board on was going to get prosecuted uh, they tried to target us we removed them all immediately and we never put them up again since we didn't think that they were a great deal of success um, but if you put them on extreme junk if you put them on heavy traffic junctions I appreciate that they would get a lot of traffic and I see the logic behind them it's just not something that we've done. But more importantly, it's very time consuming. You've got to make sure that they're consistently there. You're going to be driving around and you've got to make sure that you don't get caught because technically speaking, you are littering or you are, it's pretty much like a graffiti. So just take that into consideration. So uh, Sam has asked, what's, what is the success rate of dropping the cards on potential vendors? okay it's a bit of a random question if you don't mind me asking sam the reason being is 
that the success rate of dropping the cards on potential vendors. Now, de define what you consider a vendor. A vendor could be a homeowner. A vendor could be a property investor that's looking to sell the portfolio or their investment property. So depending, it all comes down to your message. What are you looking to achieve? Are you looking to achieve rent-to-rent -rent deals? Are you looking to achieve lease option deals? Are you looking to achieve below market value? You know, when you're deal sourcing, you don't just do, you know, depend on what your what your strategy is at is that point. Are you looking to create HMOs? So would you go into the rent-to-rent -rent strategy? There's lots of things that you need to take into consideration, but it all comes down to your message. If your message is wrong on your marketing, you're not going to generate the calls. That's why Neil and I both talk about copyright and how to create effective copy. So I hope that helps. Now, So Andrew's asked a question like, for argument's sake, what, might, what costs might involve in leaflets business cards? Now, I know you can spend up to the best part of 200 200 pounds on some leaflets and that I think that will get you anywhere between depending on who you go to could be anywhere between five and ten thousand leaflets um, now with regards to business cards etc it could you know I would suggest that you need to have a, at least a minimum between two and three thousand pound as a minimum marketing budget and look to potentially replicate that at least two or three times over the year so I would suggest that you'd need a marketing budget of around 10 grand for the year. But saying that, a lot of the strategies that we involve, like for argument's sake, if you use the strategies that Neil's employed with the tradesman, it is a very cheap strategy because you only pay them for every deal that they bring to the door. So it depends on how you look at it. So I'm just going on to one question, which is an interesting question. So... Uh, Michael's put, I'm in the countryside where many people are retiring wishing to downsize. Can these people be helped? Of course, because if they're downsizing, if they are getting elderly and they're looking to retire, you know, I've helped so many people who have wanted to go from their, from their house into a retirement home and they require the equity out of their property to pay for the fees for the retirement home. So, of course, if anything, that's in a gold mine area. Reason being is that they're not really required, you know, they don't mind taking something below market value if it's, they're not reliant on that equity to purchase another property or if they are, potentially, they're looking to downsize, which means it's going to be cheaper than their existing property anyway. So it depends on how you look at it. But more importantly, Michael, the one thing that you do have to do is work with integrity. And if you're dealing with, obviously, elderly people, don't become that investor that automatically becomes a shark. That's what, if, if anything, I'll give you that advice because these guys are vulnerable. The elderly are vulnerable. and You need to make sure that if you are going out and you are sourcing, you have to remain intact and with integrity. So, um, We've got we've got quite a few questions here. So someone's asked, and this will probably be one of the last questions for the evening, is that why would a landlord give up control of his property to you? Now, Adrian, that's a great question, and I love questions like this. But why wouldn't they give control to me? More importantly, everyone assumes landlords are these cash-rich fat cats but no one really understands what goes on behind closed doors. How many people have you seen, or how many property investors have you seen go bankrupt? It's not all roses. And this is the key, that people assume that just because they own a property, that they're rich, but what you don't know is that Potentially, there could be a lot of pain going on in the background, but this is what we talk about on the work on, on the workshop: is that how to identify what the pain is, how to identify what the motivation is, and then how to structure a deal where it creates a win-win scenario. So I hope that helps. So that guys, I tell you what, 
we've been online for nearly 90 minutes. I think we've had a great session. Uh, if there is anything that we can help with, by all means, please get in contact. You've got my mobile number sitting on your screen there. Give me a call straight after this webinar. Let's have a chat and let's see what we can do. Neil, are you still online? Yeah, I'm just sat here uh, listening with my cup of tea, Ash. Yeah, good stuff. Okay, brilliant. Is there anything that you'd like to add to that? No, I think you've, you've covered um, pretty much everything, really. Okay, brilliant. Well, on that note, I'd like to wish you all the very uh, best of luck. Have a lovely evening. Thank you for spending it both with myself and Neil. If there are any other questions, you've got our mobile numbers. You can come to, through to us directly. And let's see how we can help you. But thank you all very much. Um, uh, thank you very much again. And I look forward to seeing you all very much in the future. Take care. Good night. God bless. Thank you. Bye-bye.